player goes to work, he should not be harassed. That same type of incident, if it happened in the corporate world, it would not be allowed. It wouldn't even be tolerated. So why would it be tolerated on ice? What's up, everyone? I'm Anson Carter, and you're watching Hockey Culture. This is the place where we try to change the culture of hockey, one interview at a time. And today's guest, we have joining us, Eustace King from O2K Sports. Eustace, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. Good to see you, bud. We've known each other for a long time, Yui. I'm going to call you Yui because this is like crazy informal right now. And uh, we go way back, but I'm always curious when I have guests come on the show to talk about their experience back in the day picking up the game of hockey. Now, growing up in Chicago, uh, what was like for you? And we both share the same Caribbean descent. My parents are beige and your parents are Jamaican. What was it like getting your parents to allow you to play the game of hockey? And how difficult was that? I'll tell you this. Dude, my, my, my story is a little bit different because at the time when I started playing, I played at this rec center called Robert Crown. And it was at Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern University is. And it was really child care for me. You know, my mom and dad were working so much. And my mom was a nurse and my dad was a contractor. And for the most part, I, I didn't have a place to go after school. So this place had hockey, basketball, football, and baseball. And then uh, just like some of these big infrastructures you see in, in Canada and different communities, I just went there and it was just part of my after school activity. That's how it started. Now, was it free? Did you have to pay for it? it, it you know what? It, it was run no different than a YMCA program. So there was a, the costs were offset for kids that were, you know, uh, underprivileged. At the time, you know, I had a, you know, lower middle class family and my parents worked hard and, and at the same token, couldn't afford all the sports. So I literally just went from soccer and then I did hockey and I did baseball. And those are my three. And then my cousin um, did volleyball as well. And he ended up, he's a division one volleyball coach and had a scholarship to Ohio State. So it produced a lot of kids out of there. You mentioned costs and you played goalie. And I typically you don't get along with goaltenders like yourself and Weeks. You're probably two guys that I get along with that are net minus because you guys are a little bit different. But <laughs> who, what was it like playing net? Because I wanted to be a goaltender because I was fascinated with the gear. I loved it until I saw the sticker shock of the price of the gear. And my parents said, oh, no, that's not happening. <laughs> what was it about the goaltending position that attracted you to playing net? You know what? To be honest with you, I didn't want to play goalie either. I was all about scoring goals. I mean, we played floor hockey at school back in the day, and I loved scoring. And our goalie got hurt when I was probably, I don't know, eight years old. And I ended up playing, and I got a shutout the first game. And the next game we played again, I had another one. And so I, I was a good athlete. I was able to make saves, and I got into it. And then I loved it because people were giving me, you know, making me feel good about myself. And I did something that was solid for two games. And then I took it on from there. And you're able to ride that to Miami University uh, to play college hockey. The, the one thing that I'm trying to strive and push within the black community is using hockey as a way to pay for your education and a way to get to uh, university or college and, and graduate with a degree. I went to Michigan State. We played against each other in the CCHA. Um, what was it about Miami that attracted you to that school? You know, uh, so my best friend and business partner, Matt Oates, had already gotten a scholarship to go there. And we had literally traveled with each other our whole lives and played with each other and from the same community in Evanston. And, and uh, but I liked the school because, one, it had an up and coming hockey program and it would give me the ability to play. And then, two, I really liked that it was close for my family to see me. But as importantly, it was a really and still continues to be a high end institution for education and learning. And I graduated there and ended up having two majors. And um, it was great. And I love my teammates. One of my teammates now is the head coach, Chris Bergeron, of that program. Does a tremendous job. And we have this thing called the brotherhood that we created back then. And it was when we were playing against each other, Anson, mm -hmm. that we created this brotherhood. And it is a culture within our environment that is, one, inclusive, but all the players love each other. You're doing it for all the right reasons. And we teach and, and have bred good players out of there. You've got, you know, Alex Martinez, who's an NHLer, who's done well, won Stanley Cups. And you've got different people that have moved on into different capacities. doesn't always mean that they're going to be in the NHL, but they've also used hockey to be able to get them into empowering jobs. Well, they've called Miami the, the Ivy League school of the Midwest. And, I mean, that, that's true. I mean, I used to get up to play against you guys because Kevin Adams, who's now the general manager of the Buffalo Sabres, he was drafting the first round, and I was so jealous because, like, man, I should have been drafting the first round. 
what's, what's Kevin doing? So I would get super motivated to play against you guys. But I don't know if you remember, you're talking about the brotherhood. We had a brawl against you guys. Michigan yeah. State, when I was there, we had two brawls. One against Michigan yeah. and one was against you guys. And you guys had this, this thing where you, whenever you swept the team, you guys would try to scoop up their ice. And yeah. you guys beat us the Friday night. And we said, there's no way these guys are beating us Saturday night. And yeah. sure enough, you guys beat us Saturday. And we said, if they beat us Saturday, you're not scooping our ice. And yeah. sure enough, you guys started scooping our ice and we started to brawl. Do you remember that incident? Oh, 100%. I got a video. It's on YouTube somewhere. So for everyone who doesn't know, if we swept the team, we wanted to take a piece of them. And by scraping the ice up and putting it in a jar, we would take it and put it in our locker room. So we basically like, ah, oh, we're one up on you. And that was something that was important. So teams didn't like that. And they knew we were going to do that. And it would lead to a lot of confrontation on it and ultimately brawls because of the fact that, you know, teams didn't like that. But yeah, I remember that. That was, that was, that was fun. Well, we had this little ritual trying to scrape our ice and we weren't going to let that happen. We were a little bit pride as a hockey team. Even though we lost the game, there was no way we were going to let them take our ice and take it back to Oxford, Ohio. I was mad because I was one of the captains of state and I was looking over. I remember I look over at you. I was like, with another black guy in the ice. Am I taking him down? Like, what's what's going on? Is this going to go man oh man <laughs> It was pretty interesting. But you're uh, talking about the brotherhood. I'm going to continue with that theme. You're, like, Matt Oates, uh, one of your good friends, teammate, you and Oates, he started O2K Sports. Yeah. Uh, what was the driving force behind starting O2K Sports? Um, a lot of it was because we wanted to, to help represent people that were underrepresented. And so you had some minorities that were underrepresented. And that was definitely, and you can see in our group, we've got players of color, whether it's Chris Stewart, Wayne Simmons, a player of color is TJ Oshie. You know, he happens to be half a native. So, I mean, those are one of the key founding uh, principles, but also we wanted to help and develop young kids and people. You know, we believe that you win in life with good people around you. And if you have good people around you, you're ultimately going to have success. And, and one of the things that I believe that's important and Matt does as well is, you know, we want to make sure that ability intersected with opportunity. If you have that, then you have success. And so we built this because we felt that there was not that much out there for opportunities for players that were coming through the system to have an agent or an advisor that could relate to them or was young enough and could be um, someone that they could talk to and be more than just a guy who negotiates contract. You know, the contract piece is one piece, but we, we want to be a part of their family and be totally in the fabrics of their lives. And you look at your client list, it's pretty diverse, like you mentioned. You mentioned Stewie and you mentioned Wayne Simmons, but also you've got guys like Oshi, like you said, but there's Vincent Trocek, there's Derek Stepan. Yep. Um, there's so many different players that you have. Has there ever been a scenario where you walked into a room and whether it's a black player or white player and their parents said, no, nah, we're not really quite sure we feel comfortable with an, a black agent representing our son's interests. You know what? Ironically, that has happened to me. It's happened where I, I've had some black players have come up to me and high end big first round picks that have asked me, do you think it's that the NHL is ready to have you as my agent and me being a black player? Now, hmm. what happened? I checked the box off of highly capable, had a history, had done good contracts. Um, but their concern was, is this going to put people in a position where they feel uncomfortable? And for me, that's the other side that people don't hear. We talk about all these things that are happening in our society here. But like now, now you have a black individual or family that's wondering about, is this going to hurt them? And I'm sitting here saying, well, I don't think that happens with a, a, a white agent talking to a white player. And why would that happen to me? So I have actually lost out on some really high-end athletes because of that. But I also believe that you're going to get what you're supposed to get and that I've been able to adapt. And you look at our guys, and, and I give Jared Spurgeon, you know, he's a guy who, you know, is a hell of a player in the NHL. Um, and all these other players, Tyler Innes and Stepan, these guys have had the courage to say, you know what, I don't, I'm not worried about anything else but what you can do and your ability. And it should just come down to representation. Uh, you, you talk to some of the players you represented, Devontae Smith, Pelly, Wayne Simmons. Uh, those players have encountered racism during the course of their career. Uh, what were the conversations like with those players Have you have, like, helped them try to navigate through those waters? Because I'm sure it was a pretty difficult time for them and their families. Well, as you probably, you and I coming through, I think back then we obviously recognized that we were players of color and we were black players, but we also wanted to be treated as just hockey players. 
But as we got further, and, you know, let's use Wayne Simmons, for example. He had the incident with the banana peel. And, you know, the concern was, is what's going to happen? What are we going to do moving forward? And it actually ties in well with Devontae smith Pelly, and I'll explain. You know, when that incident happened in a neutral site in London with Wayne, one of the things that I did right away is I spoke to the league, and we talked about fan code of conduct. And my big thing is I'm a champion for players, and I want to help them, but I also don't want to uh, enable them. I want to empower them. And Wayne was upset, and I rightfully so. So right after that, we had some discussions. We worked on things with the league. We had some really good conversations about where this is going, and we really needed to, to dust off what the fan code of conduct is. A player goes to work. He should not be harassed. That same type of incident, if it happened in the corporate world, it would not be allowed. It wouldn't even be tolerated. So why would it be tolerated on ice? So now we fast forward to Devontae smith Pelly. So that incident happens in Chicago. And what happened? Well, people know what the fan code of conduct is to the point where John McDonough and gratefully because Matt Oates, my partner and best friend, grew up with me, was able to go because I was physically in Los Angeles to Chicago, to the arena, and have a discussion, and that led to ultimately a full ban. And so for us, that's what I call, you know, progress. We went from a Wayne Simmons incident to the incident with Smith Pelly to the team standing up and doing something that was in their control and their power, and it immediately led to the right result. Now, are there a lot of things that we still can do? 100%. But the same token, that to me, I think, a young guy like Wayne seeing a younger guy that he's mentored, Devante, have these issues that he had, and then being able to see that there was some call to action right away, mm -hmm. that I think made the guys feel good about themselves. And what do you think, or what were the conversations like with JT Brown? Like he was one of the first guys to, to stand up and say, you know, I'm, I'm against what's happening in the community with the police force. And he peaceful protested during a game for Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, did he come to you before that went down? Like, what were the conversations with you after that? Because JT took a lot of heat for doing that. But he was one of the first guys that, you know, not just dip his toe in. He said, you know what, this is important to me. I might not be a first-line player, but this is important to me to say something. Yeah, so JT and I spent lots of time before he ended up, you know, raising his fist. We talked about it. And I said, JT, well, what's important to you? You know, I have my thoughts. I'm a little bit older than you, but let's talk about this. And for him, you know, it was important for him to, he wanted to change what was happening in the United States. And I said, well, let's talk about this first. Let's talk about first, you're uniquely qualified to be and, and to do this in the NHL, to, to take the stance similar to Ka Kaepernick. Because one, your dad is a former NFLer and he was a big time stud in college football. Two, he is in law enforcement. He's helping young children rehabilitate. So now you understand what the law enforcement side is about. You understand what it's like being a professional athlete. And then now you're at the, 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 you know, the, the precipice of sitting here. And now what are you going to do? How are you going to make change? Well, at the end of the day, he was able to make change um, by raising his fist. But I said, let's do something locally. Let's impact our community. So our key result was to be able to get the Tampa Bay police chief to get the local officials that are empowered to make legislative changes in a room to have a conversation. So JT ultimately was able to do that and have ride-alongs and was able to impact the Tampa community. And that's what we were looking for. And then it obviously spun out nationally, but we were able to directly have an impact and a result versus us just doing something and we couldn't take it to the next level. And you think Starting off the league, because you started off as an executive of the National Hockey League before you became an agent with, with OC at O2K Sports. Uh, did that experience help you with the advice you're giving your clients now? Because you understand how the NHL industry works from a league standpoint? Absolutely. You know, I was able to work with, you know, a whole host of different executives of the National Hockey League. And it started at the top with Commissioner Bettman. And, and Gary, um, at the end of the day, between him, Brian McBride, Lou Vero, they created the Hockey is for Everyone program. And eventually, well, originally it was the Diversity Task Force. And back in 95, 96, you know, I started in 97 working in that and, and was carrying bags and doing all the stuff with Willie O'Ree. And so it was a great initiative. It continues to be a great initiative. But now we're learning that, hey, there's more that could be done. There's a lot more that we need to do. But I will say the league has been trying. But just like anything else, 
right now what's happening is you're seeing the league and everyone putting more resources and more dollars and more funds towards what's happening in our society. Whereas before, if you have a, a staff of a, a handful of people, there's only so much you can do. You could only do so much based on the bandwidth of their time, but also the amount of um, you know, resources and, and, and that you're gonna put against it financially. So now we're in a position where, hey, people are listening, they're paying attention, they're understanding what's acceptable and what's not. And now instead of having a bunch of lip services, let's get something done. Well, now I'm part of the player inclusion committee uh, the, there's a Black Hockey Player Alliance that was formed. A lot of your players are on that. One of my big issues when I played, like you just said just now, is trying to get the league's attention to get behind these initiatives and really be serious about it. And now the league is serious about it. I put these different groups together. The alliance wants to operate outside of that. Can you just talk a little bit about what their objectives might be and, and how they could be helpful to improving the cause of players of color, Black Hockey Players, Minority Hockey Players, differently than what the, the league's initiatives are trying to do? You know, look, the ACA is great. And I think it's great because of the fact that they are independent of the league. Look, the league it operates no different than any type of corporate environment. There's certain things that you can do within a bureaucratic environment. You could only do so many things and accomplish so many things. There's so many different offices and departments that need different things to be done. But how I see the HDA is being a group that can one, help say, we've lived it, guys. This is not something that we're talking about that's theoretical. We've lived it, but also we want to go ahead and begin the process of figuring out how to uh, change things, you know? And, and then they use the term eradicate racism in, 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 in hockey. Well, that's a very bold statement. That's going to need a lot of bold movement moving forward. So I know that they're sitting down. I talked to Wayne Simmons. I've talked to to Chris Stewart, I've talked to Joel Ward, we've had a lot of conversations about, hey, how can we do the things that we're doing? But the same token, there's a lot of people like yourself, myself, Brian McBride, you know, there's people who have been at the forefront and been carrying bags and doing stuff for years and years. I mean, let's look at Willie O'Ree. Willie O'Ree's been doing this forever. He was the first one, you know, and then you've got Grant Fuhrer, he's probably the most decorated, you know, NHLer, you know, period, but for sure of people of color. So here's guys that are out here that have been at the forefront and there's these di different generational challenges. What was tolerated when Willie came through and then Grant came through, you know, was something that they couldn't make changes to. Not saying that they accepted it, but it, it, was, it was more tolerated back then. Now what we're finding is it's those same actions that were tolerated back then and when you and I came through are not acceptable and they're being um, uh, addressed as we speak. And the HDA is trying to get a grasp on all of that so then they can come up and deal with different type of programming, whether it's through youth or whether it's through uh, executives to help change the game. And what are you seeing uh, in terms of differences in minor hockey? Your two boys play now on the West Coast in California. Uh, you grew up playing the game in the Midwest. Uh, how has the game changed um, from your experience as you're watching your boys now behind the bench coaching them in minor hockey and that whole experience for them? You know, when I played, I was the only one, right? I mean, I was lucky in juniors. We actually had myself and two other black players on the team. Now my son, you know, not only does he have, you know, two other black players playing with him, but, you know, we've got their parents. You know, one guy, his name is Richard Duncan. He was an Olympian for Canada as a high jumper, you know, and, and so you've got – people of color that are in the game, but you have their parents who are actually, you know, are educated and have resources and have the time to educate these young kids and other families. And the program we're playing, you know, the Valencia Flyers in, in, in California, it's, it's the furthest community north of uh, Los Angeles. We have a lot of diversity. We have Hispanics, you know, we have a lot of girls that are playing. So for us, what I see every day I am personally lifting bags and making sure that I'm having discussions so these kids know what they need to be thinking about. And my favorite person I love talking about is Willie O'Ree. You work with Willie with the NHL when they first started the program, Hockey's for Everyone, Diversity Task Force, like you mentioned. Now you represent Willie as his agent. Uh, what does Willie mean to you? You know what? This is a man who I've learned how to do things with class and dignity because that's how he operates. Uh, does he have some strong feelings? 
you bet yourself he does. Uh, has he experienced some things that he went through? But I think that for him, he's all about, hey, we got a problem. We need to fix it. Let's make some change. Let's get on it. Let's not sit here and just have lip service. And, you know, if you see things that we've been able to accomplish, you have the movie Willie that came out, you know, and, and it's about Willie's life. And it actually just ironically comes out the same time with all the stuff with George Floyd is it is a parallel. And what it's saying, though, and I think Willie would, would sit and have the same conversation with you is what happened for him in 1958 and early 60s compared to what's happening now in 2020, it hasn't changed that much. And that's a problem. Now, let's look back at technology back in the 60s and look at technology to now. It has changed tremendously. So my big thing, and I know Willie would say, is like, hey, what are we going to do moving forward? And when he gave a speech at the Hockey Hall of Fame, he just said, listen, I'm in the Hall of Fame now, but it's like a new beginning. My job is not done. And that's what I respect about him the most is that every morning he wakes up, we have discussions. Things happen with JT Brown. He wants to know and we talk about it. We talk about anything that's happening. He is at the forefront of it. And you know what? This gentleman's in his mid-80s. Mid, mid <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when we, we travel on the road together, I cringe when my cell phone rings after an event because Willie's like, where are we going now? <laughs> where are we going? Are we going to have dinner? Are we going for a drink someplace? Like, he's got that nonstop Energizer bunny, which is has been doing over the last 25 years, advancing the game within the colored community. Um, but you said something to thank you, appreciate. I mean, I've been watching you grow your business, O2K Sports, for years. I saw you do it from scratch with OT. Now your impressive roster. Uh, you mentioned Stepan, like Jason Zucker, um, Wayne Simmons, uh, Jared Spurgeon. And the list goes on and on. So you've become a powerhouse in the hockey community. And it's important for people to see there's opportunities for black people in the game of hockey, not just playing the game, but also off the ice. Absolutely. And you know what? It's conversations like this we need to keep doing. And people like yourself that are in empowered positions, that makes a difference.